today's mini lesson is going to be about the cell membrane. At this point, we have covered the principles of diffusion and osmosis, uh, which is one example of passive transport or movement across a membrane that does not require energy. If you need a refresher on that, you can go back and watch that video. Today we're going to talk a little bit more about this membrane that surrounds all of our cells. First of all, let's begin by talking about the general function of the cell membrane. Cell membrane is a selective barrier. It controls what is able to enter and exit the cell. When we talked about diffusion and osmosis, we often drew a diagram, or you saw a diagram that had a barrier in it with small openings allowing some particles to pass through and other larger particles to not pass through. So the cell membrane acts as a barrier that is able to control what enters and exits the cell. And this is important because it allows the cell to carry out one of those eight characteristics of life that we discussed at the beginning of the year. It allows the cell to maintain homeostasis or to have a balanced internal environment. That is the definition of homeostasis. So what it looks like. You have spent some time looking at diagrams which resemble this structure right here. Okay. Uh, this is an example of an animal cell. And we see all of the organelles in the interior. We have the nucleus, um, rough ER. We've got the mitochondria and all those parts. But today. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the membrane which surrounds an animal cell called the cell membrane. And if you were to look at a small section of the cell right here, if you were just to look at that section of the cell membrane that moves through there, and you were to expand it out and look at it up close, you would realize that it is, in fact, much more complex than it looks from a distance. Okay. And today we're going to talk about some of that complexity and what those structures can do for the cell membrane. First of all, I want to talk about the phospholipid bilayer. Phospholipid bilayer is the, the primary structure that, of the cell membrane. Everything else, all of those other pieces, are embedded into the phospholipid bilayer. And it's composed of two parts. We have hydrophilic heads. And we have hydrophobic tails. And it's called a bilayer. Bi means two. Layer is layer. Because there are two layers. We have one layer here. And we have another layer here. So a bilayer. And each layer has its heads and its tails. And you'll notice those words hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Hydro means water. Philic means loving. So the heads on the phospholipid bilayer on both sides are water loving. So they point towards the water, which means there is water here and here. The tails, on the other hand, are hydrophobic. And you've heard the word phobic before, maybe arachnophobic, which is uh, fear of spiders, or you know, agoraphobic, fear of open spaces. But phobic means fear, fearing. So we have our tails here, and they point into the middle where there is no water, because they are hydrophobic. 
And that's how they arrange themselves in a double layer. Tails always pointing in to get away from the water, hydrophilic heads pointing out to, to, a, to be near the water. So what can pass through the phospholipid bilayer? Remember, it's a selective membrane. So it does have openings in it, which can allow certain molecules through it. In this case, it allows small molecules. And I have some examples of there, oxygen, iodine, carbon dioxide. These things can slip through the small holes in the phospholipid bilayer and enter or exit the cell through diffusion from high concentration to low. The other kind of thing that can move through is uncharged particles. So this means they have no positive or negative charge. Okay. The other the th kinds of molecules that cannot pass through are sort of the opposite large molecules. For example, glucose, C6H12O6, and charged molecules. Okay. And then there's one special molecule that I want you to be aware of that also cannot pass through the selective membrane. Uh, because it is charged, and that is water. So if you look at this list, you might be thinking to yourself, that's strange. I know the cell needs glucose. I know the cell needs water. And if they can't get through the phospholipid bilayer, then how do they get into the cell and out of the cell? Which brings us to a discussion of things that are integrated into the cell membrane. Integrated means they are part of the cell membrane. And there are a couple of things that are integrated. First of all, we have things called protein channels. And protein channels are structures that um, the cell builds and then embeds or integrates into the phospholipid bilayer. So here we see that bilayer again, right? Hydrophilic heads, right? Hydrophobic tails. And the cell embeds these membranes in them. And the membranes provide a tube that molecules can move through, like H2O. H2O is unable to pass through the membrane on its own, but it can pass through one of these structures and move into or out of the cell. Uh, those are called protein channels, and we'll discuss those more in the next unit. The other kind of thing that you can find integrated um, in the cell membrane are carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are molecules that are also embedded sometimes in the surface of the cell, um, sometimes on the interior of the cell. And these structures act uh, in a variety of ways. They can identify the cell. They can act as a... Um, a tool for one cell to communicate to another, sort of like a little antenna. Um, but those are embedded in the surface of the cell and are important in a variety of functions, and you should be aware that they exist. That is going to lead us to a discussion of the two kinds of transport, the ways that cells can get things across their membrane, active and passive transport, and you will find that in the next lesson.